In our previous program, we spoke to you about the central place which the prayer of Jesus has in the life of the monastic and the personal rule of prayer and how it is carried out on Manathos. In this program, we're going to speak to you about the framework in which this prayer is said. And that is, that the whole life of the monk has been characterized as a hesychastic life. Isikastikizui. Now the word hesychastic is from the Greek word isikastiki, and the base of that word is isikia, which could be translated as silence or stillness. And indeed, the base, the foundation upon which the monk and the Christian can work the prayer, say the prayer, and be in the presence of God today and have memory of God, remembrance of God throughout the day, that foundation, that basis, is this stillness, this silence, this retreat from distraction and retreat from the noise and confusion of this world. Now, this, of course, can sometimes be interpreted and has been interpreted wrongly in the West as some kind of indifference to the world. Or it's been interpreted by others as strictly pertaining to the time of prayer. And that is that one keep and be in silence during the prayer, whether it be in their house or in their monastery or the time of prayer being at night. And that is true. As a rule, all the great saints and the monastics spend the evening, the night, in prayer because it is when nature and man repose and there is silence. But it is not limited to that. And in the life of the monk, silence is essential. And it is observed in many monasteries of Manathos that when one attends, one enters the monastery, there is only one or two monks who are blessed to speak to the pilgrims. And you might even, as I have, when I first attended began to speak to a monk here or a monk there, and they not answer me. Or they quickly pass by with just a word or two. And to many, it's off-putting. It causes one to have thoughts or one to be put off and be worried. What, what's the deal here? Why are they not speaking to me? It's very inhospitable. It's not the case, though. And one has to look deeper and understand the, the nature of the monastic life and what they're trying to achieve. Let's try to do that today, and using as a great example, again, I'm taking refuge in a new book written by Elder Ephraim of Philotheo, who's in Arizona, the monastery of St. Anthony there, in a new book in Greek dedicated to his elder Joseph. And he writes therein that his elder, Elder Joseph, continually reminded the fathers, the brothers in his brotherhood, that if one is silent consciously with knowledge, the guarding of the mouth awakens the conscience toward God. This was an expression that he would say often to the fathers there. The guarding of the mouth, if it's done with knowledge, that is intentionally and with care, the guarding of the mouth awakens the conscience of man toward God. And that with that, it can bring and should bring the opposite of boldness toward God, in a negative light, that is, boldness toward God. We talk about the fear of God, and by that we mean not so much being afraid of God, although there is an aspect that is true, but having reverence, humility before God. And when one, and as much as one is silent and struggles with their behavior, do not have boldness in a bad way, so much so will he be visited with tears and weep for his sins and perhaps even achieve spiritual heights that he might weep for joy in the presence of God. So much so did Elder Joseph communicate to his disciples the importance of silence in the spiritual life and the monastic life, that the brothers did not speak to one another in his presence. Not because of fear, but because of reverence toward the elder. And because they were in the presence of the elder, but also because they avoided 
idle talk. They avoided talking without need. Now this is something that is immeasurably great gift to man today. For he spends his day without perhaps even one time guarding his tongue. Of course, we're not just talking about guarding the tongue. It's not just limited to not speaking. But when we talk about silence, we're also talking about the silence of the thoughts. That one has stillness in their thoughts. And if one does have stillness in their thoughts, of course, it will be much, much harder for him to speak idly, without purpose. And if one can achieve that, well, then judgment, judging one another, judging others, is going to be far away from him. For when one speaks idly, one speaks without purpose, joking, laughing, without having any real spiritual purpose, it is very close at hand that he will fall into katakrasi, which is the Greek word for judging, judging others. And the elder friend relates to us that in his life there in New Skeet and in St. Anne's with his elder Joseph, there was this great gift of silence between the brothers. And not only between the brothers, but in fact it extended to when they left the Skeet and they had tasks and jobs to do outside of the monastery. Elder Joseph was quite strict, but in a way that brought great spiritual benefit to his disciples. Elder Ephraim relates how he would leave the skeet on a task and his elder would say, not a word to anyone until you return. Don't speak to anyone. And Elder Ephraim would wonder, well, how am I going to do the task you've given me to do? With motions, with your hand, that at most you will say, only to that person who you are going to see for the particular work, two or three words, and you will leave and depart, and you will not speak to anyone on the road. And these were ascetic achievements, indeed, for it was oftentimes very difficult to do that. People had a habit of asking, who are you, where are you from, and who is your elder? And in those days, Elder Joseph, who was a great exception in those days because of his strictness in prayer and his great hesychastic life, was misunderstood by many. And certainly the elder Joseph gave him this ascetic task of not speaking to anyone on the road, for he knew that if that people often asked, who's your elder, where are you from? He would immediately begin a conversation and they would begin to tell their opinion of his elder. And the young monk Ephraim would be thrown off by their judgment of his elder because they did not understand the spiritual heights which Elder Joseph had attained. And it would do great harm to him spiritually to begin a conversation with those who held such views. And so this was a very, very wise act on the part of Elder Joseph to protect Elder Ephraim. And he understood then after many times of going out on these trips, he understood empirically, experientially, the great, great value of silence and how it protects one from sin, from judgment, from idle talk, from bad thoughts, and how it brings, as he writes, calmness to the soul, the fruit of which is compunction. And from compunction, divine inspiration. And the fiery thoughts of divine energy and the spiritual warmth and ascent of the heart. This is all just from keeping silent. Not just keeping silent, but it is the basis upon which then one can pray and enter into the spiritual presence of God. He writes elsewhere that silence brings, as we said, compunction and remorse. And those are followed by tears. And with tears, the soul is purified. And with purification, man is made worthy to live for God in the heart and to receive unbelievable mysteries and to live the mystery of the presence of God. So again, here is one of these diamonds from the 
holy mountain, the spiritual diamonds that are provided by the great experience of the ascetic Samarathos, the great worth of silence, of stillness, of not speaking, not only with the mouth, but even in our thoughts. That we calm our thoughts, we put them away, and we fill our mind with the remembrance of God and with the prayer of Jesus. This is something that, to the degree that we can struggle in the world, with all of our cares and concerns and our tasks, to the degree that we can struggle and we can slowly order our life in such a way that we can more deeply take advantage of these spiritual gifts that God gives to the struggler, to the degree that we can do this, we will also attain compunction, divine inspiration, tears, purification, all the fruits of silence, all the fruits of stillness, all the fruits of prayer without distraction. This is all a part of the spiritual life and it's all offered to us, to every baptized Christian. If he can only order his life in such a way that he can make progress in obtaining these virtues and obtaining prayer, the presence of God. May the Holy Fathers of Athos, the Holy Elder Joseph the Hesychist, and the great example that they've given us be for us a great inspiration and help on the path toward salvation.